Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 237 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. The show is brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Duranda, and the show notes are located at continuefit.com. It's where you're going to find all the information about what we talk about on the show, as well as some of my other resources, including Strength Coach TV. All right, we don't have Coach Boyle on for this show. He was traveling to China and Long Beach for the Perform Better Summit, so um, I added an extra strength coach on. Today for the Marigold Bars, hit the gym with the strength coach segment, we have three parts. I have on Dr. Pat Davidson, Mike Stella, and TJ Lopez. Now, they're all part of a one-day seminar I am hosting with the help of Perform Better, Norma Tech, Thorn Research, Marigold Bars, strengthcoach.com, and Rock Tape. We're doing it in Long Island, New York, right outside of Manhattan at AMP Athletic Movement Protocol in Syosset, New York, on September 15th. It's a Saturday all day. And these guys are just part of an incredible lineup that also includes Brianna Diorio, Cam Joss, Frank Dolan, Matthew Flaherty, and Anna Taco. Now, Pat, TJ, and Cam will all be doing lectures and practicals. Brianna, Matthew, and Mike will be doing just lectures. And Frank and Anna will be doing TED-style talks right after lunch. I just kind of wanted to mix this up a little bit, kind of give you guys uh, just a different feel uh, and energy throughout the day. Uh, there's going to be giveaways all day from our sponsors, a catered lunch, ice bath plunge with right after Matthew's talk, he's going to be talking about kind of some of the benefits of cold plunging. Now, you can check everything out at continuefit.com forward slash amp seminar for all the details. Um, it's going to be an amazing day. Now, if you want a special price because you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to give you a VIP price. You have to email me though at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. I'm not going to give the link out. So I'm just going to, but I'll email you the link and uh, just put in the heading AMP Seminar, AMP Seminar, and I'll send you that link and I'll give you the super early bird price of $250. That is an incredible deal for this seminar. There's going to be a lot going on. We got a catered lunch. Uh, like I said, we'll get prizes all day, uh, the ice bath plunge, just so much going on. And this lineup is incredible as you'll, you'll find out more from those guys uh, on this show. All right, for the results, Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Rachel Cosgrove continues her talk about making money in your business, part two, getting current clients to spend more. I love this concept because it's very similar to the restaurant concept of increasing check average, right? Everybody's always worried about getting more clients in, but we can get more money out of our current clients and provide more value. For the functional movement system segment, Greg Cook continues his series on the functional capacity screen. Today is, is part six and that is energy storing. I am actually gonna put all these together for an episode in September, so don't worry if you haven't listened to some of the other ones. These can all stand alone, but we're gonna put them all together. For the uh, Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment, Adam Doughty and uh, Tim Robinson, I love these guys together, They're, they do a great job. They're talking about readiness and camp season, right? Obviously it's camp season now, so really important stuff. All right. Lots of things to get to you, so let's get on the phone with Coach Pat Davidson. All right, so now it's time for part one of our Marigold Bars Hit the Gym with a Strength Coach segment. I got on Dr. Pat Davidson, coach, author, lecturer, former professor, former strongman athlete. He has his PhD from Springfield, and he was a professor at Brooklyn College and Springfield College. He was also the director of training and education at Peak Performance. Now he's kind of, he's gone rogue. He's out, out there on his own uh, doing some great things. So, uh, Coach, thanks for coming on. Hey, Anthony. It's great to be back on here again and uh, looking forward to talking to you. All right. Well, you know, we're today we're talking about uh, the seminar that we're doing in, uh, in on September 15th in Long Island, so I asked it for the AMP Fall Seminar, and you're going to be doing two things, both a lecture and a practical, and it's called The Future of Program Design, Moving Towards an Objective Biomechanics-Based Model. Give us an overview first of, uh, of, of what this really means. 
Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. And uh, it's not the easiest thing to give an overview for. You know what I mean? It's, it's mm-hmm. kind of like trying to simplify a typically a presentation that takes me about two days to get through um, in, a, in like a quick snippet is always difficult, but I'll do my best here. So I, I think that, you know, the more and more that I've, I've gotten into coaching and trying to create training systems that work in large groups or work from the perspective of me not being there in, in person to coach things and, and having maybe other people coach my system from afar, um, you know, it leads to, it leads to troubleshooting and problem solving that, that I enjoy because it's kind of like a puzzle. And, um, and I think that you have, you have to create your own model. That, that you work off of. And I think that when it comes to training, you can work from a physiology-based model or you can work from a biomechanics-based model. And, you know, I think that when it comes to a physiology-based model and you start saying things like, you know, I'm going to train these energy systems or I'm going to train hypertrophy or I'm going to train the nervous system or, you know, this is, this is going to be purely oxidative or, you know, a lactic aerobic kinds of training or, or things of that nature, you're you're going to run into some some very clear and present problems with that. And and I think that they all have to do with the the history of evolution of species. You know, um, I've tried to make this comparison before of saying that evolution is a little bit like uh, the old guy down the road that has the junkyard in front of his house. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm sure you're, you're, you're familiar with somebody that's been like that at some yeah. point. Um, you know, I feel like everybody yeah. kind of kind of lives someplace where you've got that guy. And that guy always does things like makes a TV out of old poster parts or something like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you use pieces of previously intended objects to make new things out of it. And you just kind of keep tinkering. And it's like the same parts just get kind of keep getting recycled over and over again. It's not the greatest analogy in the world, but it's, it's one analogy that helps set the stage for explaining why evolution and physiology isn't the best model to necessarily go with. The second one that I, I, I try to explain to people is, is based on aviation science. And um, if aviation science had to work the same way as evolution, uh, you know, you think back to the first plane would have been the Wright Brothers plane. And, you know, all of the other derivatives of airplanes that took place between the Wright brothers and modern aircraft design. If you had to build new airplanes based on the laws of aviation or of evolution, uh, the new Boeing aircraft would have to include the parts of the Wright brothers plane and all the other planes that took place between the Wright brothers and today. You would you just have to kind of like include those parts, re-scramble them, put them back together. So what it leads to with evolution and physiology are is a lot of redundant systems. And, you know, it's funny. It's kind of like you think you're training someone for strength and power and you get a little bit of like aerobic development or you try to train somebody for purely hypertrophy and you get muscle endurance and strength and power that comes along for the ride. So, you, you know, it, it's just funny. The more physiology I learn, the more I realize like, how difficult it is to isolate any particular variable, to truly train anything. You know, you work with with kids or you work with general population people, and I've found that I build their strength better with, like, higher repetition sets as compared to lower repetition, higher percent sets. And it's just kind of like, well, why? And, and, and again, this redundancy uh, kind of comes into play and also just – it's all of these systems are always kind of working together in some way, shape or form. And, and on the individual N equals one basis, it's a total crapshoot of, of really trying to figure out really what's going on under that individual hood. So I think that the moment that you say that you're making big group training models based on physiological systems, you, you know, you're, you're just playing in this really nebulous gray area. And, um, and you can try, you can almost get too smart for your own good, and and just sort of miss miss things by trying to be too specific in terms of tackling or pinpointing one physiological system. So rather than do that, what I've tried to lay out is a biomechanics based model, and um, and this biomechanics based model is is starts from the standpoint of dividing biomechanics into kinematics and kinetics. That's, that's kind of like my beginning. I almost view this as like a flow chart. 
Um, and when I think about kinematics under the biomechanics heading, kinematics describes the quality of movement, or it describes the shapes and directions of movement. So when I think about kinematics, I divide it into further subtopics, and I categorize those subtopics as the stance that the person is, is in, the plane of movement that they're moving in, and also uh, I, I talk about it from the perspective of what kind of movement pattern is this person engaging in. So when I, when I talk about stance, I think of it as a bilateral symmetrical stance, an asymmetrical forward-back stance, or an asymmetrical lateral stance. Uh, bilateral symmetrical, you know, most commonly thought of as like the position you'd be in for a squat or a vertical jump or a, you know, a deadlift or a bench press or a push-up or any of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Asymmetrical front back would be your standard sort of lunge position. Asymmetrical lateral would be your standard kind of lateral lunge position. But when you really start to analyze those stances, you see where they crop up in athletics. And, um, and that's, I believe that they're distinct from each other and that you have to put people into those stances to be able to tackle that domain of kinematics. Um, when I talk about uh, planes of movement, that's, that's fairly self-explanatory with sagittal, frontal, and transfers, and that I, I, along with other people, believe that, that those are distinct from one another, and that if you're not actually training in those planes, then you're not developing those planes in any way, shape, or form. And, and the last one, patterns, uh, I think, you know, it sort of started in, from the weight room perspective of someone like an Ian King dividing things into things along the lines of knee dominant, hip dominant, horizontal push pull, vertical push pull. Um, you know, the typical things that we typically talk about from the weight room. I have my own 12 trainable patterns that I think of, and I have things like locomotion, change of direction, throwing um, in there along with the typical sorts of knee dominant, hip dominant pushing, pulling, um, you know, I, I divide core activities into those that target the pelvis and those that target the thorax. Um, but, you know, I would say that we, can, we all have our, our movement patterns that we attack and train. And I just think of it from the perspective of, you know, I, I need to be able to think of activities that correspond with patterns. I want to think about how I can train those patterns in each stance and how I can train each pattern in a stance moving in a plane. And, and that's sort of how I begin categorizing activities that are trainable for athletic populations. Um, from there, I move into the kinetics realm of biomechanics, and that's more the quantitative side of things. And I, again, have three divisions that I work within from a kinetic standpoint, and those divisions are load, velocity, and duration. And, um, you know, you could really divide those however you want. And, and somebody like a Brian Mann might have a tremendous number of divisions from the standpoint of like uh, velocity-based training. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, I just keep things simple and I just go with three divisions on all of those. For load, I go with heavy, moderate, and light. With velocity, I go with fast, moderate, and slow. And with duration, I go with long, short, and middle. And, um, you know, from, from my viewpoint, and again, I try to numerically categorize all of those things in the kinetic side of things. It's almost like bumper bowling. As long as you're within these, these confines, it, it qualifies you as, as high load, low load, moderate load. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really anybody's call. Like my high load would be 80% plus. My high velocity would be uh, over one meters per second. My long duration would be anything. I, I think I put it at like two minutes or two minutes plus or something like that. But but anybody can, can create it in the numerical confines of wherever they choose to put it. I, I just choose to put things, like for duration, in my mind, I'm thinking along the lines of, of energy systems indirectly, um, you know, from the standpoint of long duration would be more oxidative, middle duration, more glycolytic, short duration, more phosphogenic. Um, but in my mind, I feel like I don't need to have as much of a physiology-based mindset if I'm creating activities that correspond to checking off these boxes, that I'm training all these patterns within the stances, within the planes of motion that, that exist, and that I'm creating activities that belong in those kinematics domains as well. Um, you know, I, I always give this example for people to begin to understand this, I think. Um, 
I, I use CrossFit as an example, and I say that CrossFit basically owns the bilateral symmetrical stance sagittal plane uh, world, and they do a really good job within those stances, within that stance and plane. And I, I say that from the standpoint of they do a lot of different movements, and, and they do it from the standpoint, they do it in different uh, load zones, velocity zones, and duration zones. You know, they, they do strength training, they do Olympic style lifting, they squat, they deadlift. Um, you know, those are all bilateral symmetrical stance, sagittal plane, high load, uh, short duration, um, you know, moderate or, or low velocity activities. They also uh, do their conditioning in those places as well. They do things like the rower, they do burpees, they do wall balls. Um, those things correspond to different duration, velocity, and loading profiles. But they, they really cover the kinetic side of things really, really well. They just don't do much in the other domains of kinematics. And in my mind, it's probably why they, they probably have some higher incidences of injuries and things like that when they try to do activities that live in those other kinematics worlds. So, you know, like what I see happening with this kind of stuff is that it, it allows you to be able to have a spreadsheet and begin to quantify and, and, and just determine, like, hey, am I training all of the relevant trainable patterns? Am I putting my athletes into all of the available stances? And am I moving them in all of the planes of motion? Like, I would say, hey, start there first. Are you actually filling in all of these boxes that exist from the standpoint of categorizing activity? And if you are doing that, like, take a look. Are they moving in different velocities? Are they training with different kinds of loads? And are they doing things from different duration standpoints? You know, I, I just think that, that ultimately we'll probably be able to use that kind of a system to, with like a computer algorithm or something to be able to actually uh, determine, like I, I could see it making up a visual profile of this stuff, you know, uh, looking at, at, at certain athletes and saying, well, you know, you're, you're really not doing any activities in this box over here. Like you're missing um, these high load, low velocity activities, and that's a problem with your physical development. So, um, you know, you could do that for any number of these things, or, or we could even do the opposite and figure out what kind of athletes need certain boxes filled in, and they don't really need to worry about other boxes. Um, yeah. So I, I think that, I think it leads towards number one, just better categorization of the activities that we're having people do. And, and number two, I think it's going to possibly lead towards better discussion amongst coaches, again, with like a common language that we can all use to describe things, as well as being able to compile data and, and start looking at trends that, that are very easy, like low-hanging fruit trends that we can have actionable steps towards solving and, and managing problems that are common amongst all of us that work in this field. Mm -hmm. Coach, now, yeah, that's really interesting. Obviously, there needs to be more. This is, obvious, like you said, it takes you normally two days. But um, I find this really interesting. And and But at the same time, I'm just, you know, going to play devil's advocate with it almost, is there, is this, is this semantics? Because, like, for example, like, is load can load or like energy systems, you know, like you said, could be fit into duration. And so we, you are still using some physiology within your system, right? I am. Yeah. I just think again, like um, when you try to get too cute with these things, like, you know, I, I think that um, I've, I've learned and, and worked with, with some guys that are super smart physiology guys, like a guy like Aaron Davis down in, in Austin, Texas comes to mind, and, and he uses a lot of technology to measure things. Like he uses the Moxie device um, to be able to actually, in real time, look at how much oxygen is inside your muscles. And it's just super interesting to watch the way different people um, get their way, make their way through protocols, um, because different people have very different strategies. And um, you know, he divides people into like people that are occluders versus non-occluders, and he can see it in like the blood flow going through muscles and the amount of oxygen in there. And, and he'll have different things that people will do. But it's just eye-opening to me in terms of how much individual variability there is 
with the strategies that people come up with to do the same activity. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and to me, it's, it's just, it's really difficult to be able to, you know, we're, there's always going to be a compromise when you're working with groups and you're creating in, in some way, shape or form. We never like to call them cookie cutter models, but let's face it. A lot of these things are cookie cutter models. Yeah. Um, if you're going to be coaching 60, 70 people at the same time, I, I just think that if you create these, these buckets, if I know that if you're working and doing the same pattern in a direction for over two straight minutes, I have a very good feeling that there's going to have to be oxygen present in that muscle um, the whole time. Otherwise, you just simply wouldn't be able to actually continue on for that much time. Um, so you're, you're definitely correct from the standpoint of like physiology and my understanding of physiology is a backbone of this. But it's, I think it's my appreciation of the complexity of physiology that makes me say it's too much to actually wrap your mind around and you might drive yourself crazy um, by trying to use that specifically as your, as your model. You, yeah. you know, um, and, and oftentimes you can hit multiple birds with one stone if you're thinking along the lines of this biomechanics categorization model. Okay, great. Would you say that uh, Gary Gray has kind of got on the opposite end? You said um, uh, CrossFit has the kinetics piece kind of mm -hmm. figured out. Would Gary Gray have the um, the kinematic piece down probably a little bit better, like in terms of stances and planes and patterns? Would you would you agree to that? Yeah. Well, I, I have a bit of a nuanced answer there because, okay. like, part part one of my presentation is what I just talked about. Um, and part two of my presentation is essentially like creating an objective checklist for determining if you're actually moving in a plane properly. Uh, because I believe that you have to match um, sensory and motor proficiencies to actually say that you're doing things properly. And, um, and I've seen enough practitioners of, of Gary Gray's methodology do things that they're saying are moving them, let's say in the transverse plane or the frontal plane. And they're like, when I watch them, I say to myself, well, the pelvis and the thorax are not in the proper place for you to actually be training the frontal plane. Like based on where the stance foot is, the pelvis is, is opposite direction. Like they're, they're trying to be on their left foot as their stance foot and their pelvis is shifted to the right and their thorax is shifted back over their foot. So they're, they're never going to really be loading an adductor when they should be. So it's kind of like, I think that the thought process is proper in terms of putting people into different stances and moving them uh, in different planes, particularly using things like arms and legs as drivers to be able to move the, the pelvis and the thorax where you want it to go. But the execution, I feel like, doesn't have enough objective um, standards by which it's being measured. So I, I think that's the second part. Like, I, I'm trying to ultimately create like a binary system, a, a, a right-wrong of, of whether or not you're actually training these planes that you say you're training. Because if you're not able to feel an adductor, a glute med, um, lateral trans transverse abdominis, a serratus, um, you, you are not actually getting into the frontal plane. Uh, you know, so it's, it's kind of like, I think that that stuff is super important and it's the other part of this. And, and again, I want to make this stuff easy for coaches. Like, here's what you need to see from a, from a motor perspective. If you're a coach and you're looking at the athlete, you need to understand things like, you know, if they're in the frontal plane and they're training on the left side, if they're, they're, they're moving left and they're absorbing forces that are going left, like you need to see that their left knee is over their left big toe, their zipper is over their knee, their sternum is over their zipper, and their neck is over their sternum, and the nose is over the neck. Like if you're not seeing that shift in that proper lineup, well, I don't know what you're actually training, um, but you're probably not training the appropriate muscular structures that would be truly frontal plane muscles.
Interesting. This is really interesting. I'm really looking forward to uh, kind of getting a little bit more of a deeper dive in your lecture and practical at the AMP Fall Seminar. So, uh, Coach, thanks for coming on and kind of giving us an overview. Uh, you definitely left me with uh, uh, a taste for, for more. I want a taste for more. So uh, thanks for coming on. You got it, Coach. Thank you so much. Hey guys, just a reminder, Perform Better, the huge summer sale. This is their biggest one. 40% off, so many items. This is such a great sale because everything is included. Sleds, dumbbells, kettlebells, foam rollers, so many of their best items. Also, don't forget, there is the Perform Better Functional Training Institute. So I know this, the seminar season kind of just passed in terms of their summits. We, I actually just got back from Long Beach, the, the summit out there. Um, but they still have events in Rhode Island and they have functional dry needling coming up September 7th and 8th. And then they have a speaker school in October. So you can check all of that out at performbetter.com. It's Rachel Cosgrove with the Business of Fitness segment. We're going to talk about how to run your business. And uh, one of the things we talked about at the last podcast is the last segment I did was um, how to make more money in your business, how to earn more and worry less. And I think we're all on board with that. And so the three things we talked about were number one, adding more clients. And on that last segment, we talked about how to add more clients, really getting into the marketing. And, um, and then number two is getting those clients to spend more. And so I want to talk about that today. How do we get those clients to spend more? So once we do get more clients in the door, or even with the current clients you have, you don't always want to be dependent on constantly having to add new members to your gym. So how can we go ahead and really offer more value to the clients that we already have? So one thing easy would be raise your prices, right? So that would be an easy way to get clients to, to spend more, um, raise your prices. So we do raise our prices once a year. And the thing with this is it actually can um, end up being part of our first strategy of adding more clients because we actually use it as a membership drive. So each year when we do raise our prices, we usually do it in either February or September, usually a time of the year when it's busier, um, when people are going to be looking for gyms, they're already signing up for gyms. And so letting everyone know that, hey, everyone, on February 1st, we're going to be raising our prices or September 1st, we're going to be raising our prices. And you let all your current clients know that um, this is the day we're going to be raising our prices. And so um, they can then invite any of their friends and family or anybody they know who has been wanting to join your gym to come in and join before you raise your prices. The other thing we do is we do have a loyalty program at Results Fitness. So we do keep our current members on their same price. We always honor the deals we made with our current members. And so as long as they stay a member and they renew within 30 days, their prices will not go up. And so we have members that have been with us for literally 18 years who still pay what they joined on 18 years ago. Um, but, you know, there are most there are raving fans. They're the people who, if you walk into our gym, they're going to, you know, grab you and make sure that you know that how wonderful results fitness is and that you become our next member. And so, um, that really builds that loyalty. And so that's something that we do stick to is, um, you know, really honoring the deals we made and not raising prices on existing members, but raising prices on our new members. And so that's one way to get people to spend more right within your business. Another way is to, uh, add, uh, add value, right? So upsells. I mean, we all know the famous story of McDonald's when they added the one question of, would you like fries with that? And they added billions of dollars of sales in fries to their bottom line. So, um, you know, that's, that's the idea, right? One with one question, um, what could you offer to your clients? What's some of the value that you could offer to your clients? Um, at point of sale, when you are getting them signed up for a membership, you could offer them a nutrition program. You could offer them extra sessions. You could offer them an upgraded membership. So these are all things they may all ready need or want or be looking to have you offer to them, think about it as you're giving them the opportunity to take advantage of the value that you're offering. And also just think through, what do you, what about you? What do you take yourself? Um, what supplements do you take? Uh, sharing is caring. So share whatever it is that you find is, you know, is something that's part of your secret to success in your own fitness regimen. I mean, if like your clients want to know what you're doing and so whatever supplements you're taking, you should be selling those to your clients. You should be offering that value to your clients. Um, you know, if there's a multivitamin you love, call them up and see if they have a wholesale account. Uh, we use, um, companies like private label fitness where we can get our own private label 
on the supplement. And that allows us, you know, where people will come in and they know that it's branded by us and it's um, something that we stand behind. So if you're not currently offering your current clients supplements that at least that you believe in, because if you believe in supplements and you're not offering them, then you're doing them a disservice. So start to sell supplements, um, post-workout nutrition for us. We believe highly in post-workout nutrition. It's the one meal we have absolute control over for our clients. And so, uh, we have a shake cafe that we, uh, serve all natural shakes. And so that's something that most of our clients take advantage of right after their workout, they grab one and they even come in on their off days and they bring their friends and family by to grab a shake as a meal replacement. So that's something else that you could work on. And if you're not ready to put a shake bar in, then, you know, get a fridge with, um, some already ready to make, to drink, uh, you know, shakes, or we've even had, um, a lot of our coaching members in results fitness university, they've put together, um, what they call a dry shake bar. So, um, with, you know, protein powder, shaker cups, and basically your clients can kind of shake up their own shake, uh, depending on what they're looking for. And you might have other things for sale. You might have, um, some recovery tools, you know, maybe foam rollers, uh, you know, like Theraguns are big right now. Any of the things that you tend to use yourself or that you find, um, you know, work really well, we sell lacrosse balls. Uh, you know, these are real simple things that can add extra revenue to your, um, to your bottom line, but then also giving your clients more value. Um, recommended books, clothing is a big one for us. We get new clothing in every month and our clients love it. So if you get different styles in and you get, you know, um, that can definitely be something that your clients will take advantage of. So just start to think about, you know, what are some of the different ways that, um, I can offer more value to my current clients to get them to spend more once they are a member of results, or even when I am signing them up as a member of, um, your gym and uh, that way they can, you know, that can add to your revenue. So we're going to go ahead and wrap that up. I'm going to get to the third uh, piece of the puzzle as far as um, earning more and worrying less on the next segment of the podcast. So uh, check in to that next segment. We'll see you guys then. Um, if you want any more information on what we're up to and some of the events we have coming up, check out resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Talk to you guys soon. All right, now it's time for part two of the Marigold Bars Hit the Gym with a Strength Coach segment. And I have on Mike Stella, who is a certified athletic trainer, corrective ex exercise specialist, and performance enhancement specialist. He's also, he runs the recovery lab at AMP, where we're having uh, the AMP Fall Seminar. So Mike's an integral part of what's going on at AMP. Uh, kind of helping rehabilitate and recondition athletes uh, of all kinds of sports and uh, whatever, like bodybuilders, CrossFit competitors, athletes, you name it. Mike does it. Uh, former lacrosse player, uh, Division One lacrosse player, uh, but he went to Marist and has his bachelor's from there, and he has a master's in sports management from George Washington University. Mike, thanks for coming on. Oh, Anthony, thank you so much, man. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to, talk to you more. All right. Well, you know, as you know, we're all excited about the AMP Fall Seminar. And, uh, you know, I think with your lecture, you know, you're kind of the bridging the gap guy because, you know, you're the one who's working uh, with uh, with injured, injured, uh, you know, being an athletic trainer. You're working with all these uh, guys, people that come into the recovery lab and, and come to see you. Um, and your lecture is the pain of performance using the art of perception to overcome pain and unlock your movement potential. And again, pain right now, pain has been uh, over the last couple of years, really getting a lot of attention, especially with this idea of, uh, I don't want to say pain in the brain, but uh, coming from the brain. And I, I'm really interested in this kind of this idea about using the art of perception. Give us an overview of uh, what your lecture is going to be. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a really good point. And this is something that um, for me, like kind of blew a mortar shot off my brain. Um, you know, I think throughout our careers, we all have to kind of take a step back periodically and evaluate, like, are we doing what we think we're doing when it comes to anything, whether it's treatment or training or rehabilitation, wherever you are on that spectrum. And for me, you know, like learning more about pain and neuroscience recently over the last few years, you start to really question some of the things that were classically taught when it comes to rehab, specifically with like manual therapies, you know? And, and so that's kind of where I started. The whole idea was, you know, like I have this paradigm shift where 
I used to think I was breaking up tissue. I used to think I was lengthening muscle and deforming fascia when I did, you know, my manual and instrument assisted techniques. And all these years later, the, the emerging science, you know, and understanding that we're really not mechanically breaking anything down, um, but we are seeing these amazing results. Why is that? And then you start looking into like the pain science and the neuroscience community for answers. And to be honest with you, I, I find that the, the, the answers there are far more compelling than what we were doing before. So for pain and performance, I wanted to kind of take that full circle because, you know, I really do believe in buy-in. You know, I think if you really need, if you really, if your goal is to help somebody get better and to move better and to feel better, then you have to get them to buy in. And perception is part of that also. Um, so it's really going to be kind of a multifaceted kind of looking at the same problems from different perspectives. Um, so we're going to look at, you know, the biological stuff, like what are the classic things that we see in performance centers and gyms all over America, like foam rolling, right? Foam rolling 20 years ago, you never see a foam roller in a gym. Now there's a foam roller in every gym in America. You walk in, you'll see an area of foam rollers. And I think the common perception is that, you know, we're actually loosening stuff up. And, and so I'm going to explain kind of the neurophysiology behind that um, and then go a little bit deeper into some of the cognitive perceptions we have as coaches and as rehab people in the industry, but also even going even further into that emotional and social aspect. It's kind of pulling that biopsychosocial model together and then giving some actionable strategies that we can use to, you know, facilitate people to feel better, move better, and hopefully move more often. And that's, I think that's what we're all trying to do on some level. Absolutely. And Mike, you're, you're a guy who is kind of bridging the gap with this idea of, of, you know, therapy and rehab kind of almost like Charlie Weingroff's idea of, uh, you know, uh, uh, rehab equals training, right? Um, and training oh, equals sure, rehab, yeah. right? Um, is, is what you're talking about, obviously, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of trainers in the house. This is going to be really for all of us. This is not just for the, tra- the you know, the athletic trainer or, or, or physical therapist, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, this is, I'm going to kind of zoom out a bit more so that it, it'll capture really anybody who's in the health and fitness industry, you know, and again, and it's just really just challenging current, you know, some of the current ideologies or not even current, some of those traditional ideologies that we still bring with us, um, you know, things that are, we've always done it this way. That's why we're doing it. So just challenging some of that thought process and bringing it all together. But like you said, even like with Charlie's, you know, train, uh, rehab equals training, training equals rehab. That was, that was a really, uh, strong influence on me earlier in my career. Um, and I do kind of consider myself in that like reconditioning phase, but you know, I think it's interesting because in healthcare in all other aspects of healthcare, we'll use treatment as a means of prevention. Uh, and we don't necessarily do that in orthopedics In orthopedics, we kind of wait for the wheels to fall off. And then we go to the doctor to figure out why after the fact, you know, I think there's that, obviously that there's that strong contingency of personal trainers and strength coaches that are out there educating themselves on, you know, screening and actually doing deeper evaluations before you get started. And I think that's a huge part of changing, you know, this uh, broken uh, model that we have, but I, I think it's still not really perfused throughout the industry en- enough. So I'm hoping that this lecture can maybe be the jumping off point, maybe doing some more stuff with this but uh it's really exciting for sure mike talk to us about the art of perception though is that like us also trying to coach people or really you know some of this using i i forget who i spoke with uh on pain on pain science uh maybe it was adam fast um just talking about this idea of you know the way we coach clients and what we say to them about pain and talking about some of these things. Is that part of what you're going to be talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to bring in some basic pain science that we can all understand. um, And we can all agree with conceptually. We'll be like, Oh, you know, like it kind of makes, that makes sense. You know, like I've always thought of it this way, but I never really had the, the reason or the science behind it, but absolutely. I mean, you know, pain is the opinion of your brain, you know, it's an output, you know? And so if you're changing these inputs, right. And so the inputs that we're going to focus on, trying to change. And again, whether you're a strength coach or a personal trainer or a rehab person, you know, we have sensory or biological inputs that we can manipulate. We have cognitive inputs that we can manipulate and we have emotional and social inputs that we can manipulate. And if you change somebody's input, the hope is that we get a desired output. It doesn't always work that way because the brain, that person's brain is going to make the decision of what that output's going to be, but that could be pain, 
their motor control. It could be their behavior. It could be any number of different outputs that we get. And so I really think like, you know, for us as healthcare and fitness people, we're almost more like that, you know, uh, switchboard operator. You know what I mean? So we're switching some inputs and outputs to gain some different outputs and then using those outputs as an opportunity to, hey, if I can get this person feeling a little better, that knee isn't so, isn't biting them so much today. Now I have an opportunity to actually build some capacity, you know, but we have to zoom out a little bit and stop, you know, just trying to solve uh, hardware problems with software solutions, you know, and start to really examine the software more and see if we can't, again, in that, in that coaching setting, really bring somebody forward by just having them understand their body objectively and, you know, a little bit more clearly. Mike, what were, I just want to go back to kind of your uh, evolution into some of this stuff. What was really the biggest thing with pain that you've kind of had to change over the last few years when you kind of, you know, started to really uh, have this paradigm shift? Well, I think, I think intuitively it started when I was uh, in college and, and um, I, you know, I was an injured athlete. I, I had a catastrophic knee blowout in high school, kind of really limited my options for college and playing lacrosse. So um, I, I dealt with pain, chronic pain for a, a few years after that. Um, and I kind of continued to, you know, I worked hard and I did everything I was told to do, but I, I really struggled with being the same athlete I was before. And that kind of lit the fire in my belly. And I think, you know, it was in the, you know, the, the late 2000s, we started seeing more science emerging on how, you know, and I was really into manual therapy after college. I saw that you could put your hands on a person or an athlete and instantly change the way that they move. And I was in, I was, I was all in when I was at Florida and I was doing the manual therapy and we were, it was like tuning up race cars, you know, for our track and field athletes. Um, so just to see the instantaneous response, and I was just, you know, I, I, I just became mildly obsessed, I would say, or I don't call it passionate. I became passionate about manual therapy, you know, so I'm doing it, I'm getting great results, integrating it with my, you know, my fitness and my exercise background, which worked really well. But then this research comes out that says, well, we're not breaking stuff up. We're not, we're not, you know, uh, lengthening tissue and, and deep tissue doesn't necessarily mean anything. And, and so you know, that's kind of like that. Oh my gosh, am I going to have a job in a few years? Like once this becomes mainstream, you know, um, mm -hmm. but, but, but it works and we all know it works. And, you know, manual therapies are just one of those things that are just so hard to study. You know, they're so hard to get empirical double blind randomized control trials on because it really is a perception tool. Um, and the way that you use that tool when it's paired with education can be extremely powerful uh, in, in changing the way people think and the way people act and their habits and their behaviors. And if that's what you, that's what we need to do. You got to change somebody's habits and behaviors in their life in order to really get them to change the way they feel. And so that's what pain or performance is really going to be about is, you know, what are the tools that we have at our disposal in a gym from a coaching perspective? And, and you don't even need to do manual therapy. So I'm going to talk about manual therapy. I'm also going to talk about things like foam rolling and using massage sticks and massage balls. And, you know, the things that we're coaching our clients to do from a fitness perspective and just kind of bring that all together. But yeah, I think it was that paradigm shift was really more understanding like, Hey, I don't have to crush people because I'm not lengthening their muscles. And so, you know, starting to back off and having it be more about the experience, I started getting even better results than I had been getting prior to. And that was really kind of the, okay, this is more neuro and the way people are, or perceiving this and why your environment and like, you know, for TJ and I, when we put recovery lab together, everything was specifically designed from the color to the feel of the room to like breaking that stigma of healthcare, because we wanted to change people's perception of healthcare. So that was like a, a huge factor and that nobody sees that, you know, nobody sees the reason, you know, that reasoning behind why it's electric blue in my room and not the same color branding as everywhere else. But, um, yeah, it's a really fun topic. I'm really excited to uh, to share what I've put together so far. Very cool. Yeah, Mike, I want to finish up with this idea about client buy-in because, you know, there's been this, uh, you know, when you talk about education uh, and educating the consumer, it's a tough, it's a tough deal, uh, you know, just because obviously with, mm -hmm. especially with what you're doing, because, you know, it's like some seriously advanced, you know, uh, lots of big 25 cent words. Um <laughs> so, so for you with client buying, because Mike, look, normally people are so used to, and I have a lot of close, like people in my life that are, are feel this way. Oh, 
Mike's going to go fix me. No, I always tell him, like, no, Mike's not going to fix you. Mike's going to help you, but you're going to have to do a lot of work on your own right. as well. How do you get that client buy-in? Uh, you know, and again, I, I think it's, you know, part of it is managing expectations and, and you, we all have to understand that when our clients come to us, they have certain expectations, you know, so I could say like, Oh, Hey, listen, Johnny, your, <clears throat> your back is bothering you because you lack great toe extension. Like if I could make that bridge for you and make that make sense, that's a reach. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's really hard for somebody to be like, well, I really doubt my big toe is causing this crippling chronic low back pain that I'm experiencing. But when you start working on their low back, for example, that perception to them is, oh man, finally, someone's actually taking the time to work on this, you know? And, and I think part of that is obviously we got to look at what we're doing, you know, in healthcare. And I think over the last 10 to 15 years, we've really seen big watering down, you know, in the insurance carrier model, you know, where, you know, like, for example, you, you know, that same person with low back pain, they might go to their doctor and say, oh, you got some herniated discs. Um, well, let's do this. I'm going to give you a four to six weeks of physical therapy. We'll see if that works. And then and then, we're, then we'll schedule you for surgery. It's just like six weeks. It's like, you know, like it took you a long time to get this way. Six weeks is just a ridiculously short window of time to make appreciable changes in the way somebody moves in their habits to get them to, to not stress that back so much, you know? So we, we kind of set ourselves up for failure. And so I think part of it is you've got to get people to feel a little bit better early on. And that means spending time with them and, and addressing not only their fears and their anxieties, but also addressing their physical symptoms and there's something really powerful about when somebody takes the time and and actually puts their hands on you and you make that physical connection with somebody that's why i, I believe manual therapy kind of checks off all three boxes when it comes to perception it it, it satisfies that social perception because now i'm building a connection with you it satisfies that cognitive perception because you know you're saying okay finally mike's working on my back man i'm finally going to get better and then it's working on that physiological or that biological perception from changing the way your brain is going to interact with that tissue. You know what I mean? So it's, it checks off all three. And that's why I'm so, I'm still so passionate about it. And I think, you know, we need to kind of go back to the old school ways 50 years ago when you went to a physical therapy clinic, a lot of it was hands-on work and we've gotten away from it because the evidence doesn't support it. But like I said, the evidence, you know, the absence of evidence isn't the evidence of absence, you know, and, and it's, it's part of those things where I think, we need the evidence to guide us and not necessarily shackle us into modalities that, you know, there are no one-to-one -one correlations in a human being. It just doesn't exist that way. You know what I mean? It, it, you can't just, and I think it's funny when it comes to professions, it's athletic trainers should only work with, you know, a musculoskeletal. We're not supposed to work with neuro, but it's like, if you're training somebody on a squat, that's a neuro thing. You know what I mean? That movement pattern is neurological. So it's definitely an interesting topic. And I think the industry is starting to blur some of these lines between the professions. And I'm really excited to see what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. But again, this topic, I feel like is one of those things that we just don't talk about enough in our didactic studies. We don't talk about buy-in and getting people to believe that they're going to get better. You know, and I was inspired greatly by Brett Bartholomew's book, Conscious Coaching. I know that's, you know, that's geared mu very much to, you know, the personal trainer and the strength coach, but I think it's really a must read for any rehab person, you know, to really understand that, you know, there's a person in front of you and not just, you know, origin, insertion, action, blood supply, nerve supply, and a bunch of bones, you know? Absolutely. Great stuff. Well, everybody can tell, we can tell how passionate you are about this. And I will remind everybody <laughs> that, you know, the recovery lab is inside of AMP. So you'll get to see where, uh, not only get to see Mike lecture, but to see his, uh, his, uh, where he's working every day. And he's going to be around all day for those uh, in between conversations. So Mike, thanks for coming on and uh, kind of giving us an overview and a little bit more about your topic at the AMP Fall Seminar, Pain of Performance, Using the Art of Perception to Overcome Pain and Unlock Your Movement Potential. Thanks again, Mike. Thank you so much, Anthony. Have a great rest of your day, man. Hey, this is Adam. And this is Tim. We're here with the Train Hook Data-Driven Coaching segment. Ooh. Today, Tim, we're going to talk about the season. Yes. So the season is camp season and the pre-competition phase in general. Excited. And when you do studies on player readiness, this is, a, this is the time of year you usually look at because mm -hmm. you have this intersection of high training loads in strength conditioning yep. and sport practice. Yep. And you can actually witness how these readiness scores, these subjective reports, will decay with, as training loads increase. So what are you going to do about it? That's the important thing. So we're always going to know what our action plan is if we see bad scores. Yeah. And so let's kind of break down our survey here and let's go through the items and 
tell folks what they can actually uh, do with the data. Cool. So the big one's sleep, obviously. Yeah. And, you know, to me, the biggest thing is that pretty much everybody will lie to themselves and tell them, say that they can get by on less than they actually need. Right? Yeah. We call that sleep quantity, right? Most people think six or seven hours. Really, that's more like nine hours. And it's scientifically proven that, you know, especially in the short term, if you get up to that nine hours of sleep, you're going to perform better. Right, or even, you know, sleep extension beyond what you would consider your norm, Yeah. right? And the short term does improve performance. So there's a time and a place to push people, right? This might be where you, you kind of pull that lever, like, hey, let's focus on sleep. You need to get more sleep, guys. Right. So sleep quantity is obvious. What about quality time? Yeah, sleep quality. We, we address things such as room temperature, right? Uh, the actual darkness in the room sounds silly, but you should be able to see your hand in front of your face, right? Little things like that will promote better sleep. Right. So you, you want the right environment to actually fall asleep and stay asleep. Yeah. And cool, dark, and quiet is the way it's got to be. Yeah. Okay? So let's talk about a couple items that are uh, related, but they're a little different. So sure. stress and mood. So mood is your general affect, you know, how you're generally feeling. And stress is more about what's going on in your life and how you respond to it, how it mm-hmm. affects you. These things are definitely uh, affected by high training loads. Yes. Right? That's stress. It goes in that bucket, right? Right. Um, and you know, so hormonal changes, you know, show up in these these subjective reports. It's yeah. part of why they're so useful. Um, so stress and mood, you know, to me, Tim, like this is something you can help people with by just giving them an opportunity to chill out sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. We we do we have like yoga sessions, right? Which is you're focusing on the parasympathetic nervous system, focus on breathing, and maybe eliminating some things at the end of practice, like conditioning. Let the let the players just lay on the field, let them relax, let them breathe, look up at the sky. Mm-hmm. Right. So this, you know, this is, you know, the Denver Boulder area. So we would call that like meditation, right? <laughs> Maybe you don't want to go down that road, but really like you're talking about some of the same stuff, which is like, uh, you know, you're letting your mind relax, relax. you're focusing on breathing, yep. you're giving yourself a chance to just calm down. Right? Sure. Okay. So now we've got soreness and energy, the last two items, right? Yeah. Um, so these things to me, Tim, are definitely affected pretty heavily by, yeah, training stress, but like, yeah. nutrition plays a big role. Absolutely. We, when we address nutrition, we talk about not only caloric intake, but putting the right calories in your body. Okay, we also have some modalities we can use, like utilizing the pool, right? Uh, to get them in there, let them float around, take some stress off their you know, physical body. So that a little bit of like low, um, low intensity, yeah. uh, you know, re- restorative work is, again, about increasing parasympathetic tone. You got it. Right? Cool, man. So you got to get the right, you got enough calories, you get enough protein. And then yep. the next step would be to decrease their, their training stress somehow. Yep. So maybe give them some reps off and practice something like that. You cool. got it. Hey, that's going to do it for us today. Go to trainheroic.com to start your 14-day free trial. When you're talking to one of our representatives, be sure to tell them the Strength Coach Podcast sent you for 10% off a year of the Pro or Elite Edition. All right, now it's time for part three of the Marigold Bars Hit the gym with the train coach segment. Our special episode uh, highlighting the AMP Fall Seminar. I have the owner of the Athletic Movement Pro- Protocol, AMP, in Sayasi, where we're having. He's our host as well, TJ Lopez. TJ, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for having me, Anthony. And I got to say thank you for uh, ha- having us host this this awesome event. Really looking forward to it. It's uh, you know I'd say it's one of those things that you know as a business owner. In strength and conditioning, it's one of those things like a dream come true to have a, a lineup like we have, and I'm just super excited and uh, I'm super motivated for this for this event in about a month. I agree, man. I'm just kind of really excited for for all that we're doing. Not only just kind of having some great speakers, but mixing it up with you know you know <laughs> you and you and Cam and and Pat having you know lectures and practicals, and Matthew and and Brianna and Mike having just lectures, and then Frank and Anna having some Ted style talks. We're going to do some cold baths, you know, some ice bath plunging. We got some giveaways all day from our sponsors, from, uh, you know, from rock tape and Norma tech and Marigold foods and form better, uh, and uh, doing some stuff with Norma tech. So it's going to be a fun day. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's talk about what you're talking about. And that's, you have a lecture and a practical. It's the athlete breakthrough building a system that produces repeatable results through a principled approach to evaluating coaching and motivating your clients give us an overview of what we're going to be getting from you um so and pretty much you know over here at amp we train a lot of athletes okay uh but we treat everyone every athlete that walks through the door whether it's obviously a high school college or pro athlete or it's just that weekend warrior we're going to approach them with the same type of an evaluation and the same professionalism we would if you were 
you know, training to be an Olympian. So, uh, you know, I think that that's something that across the board, many, many coaches and many, um, many people are out there talking about, but I think, you know, over, over the years, we've really had some great people in the industry that have, have been giving us the greatest information, the most up-to-date information. And sometimes it's a little bit of information overload, right? For a younger coach mm -hmm. um, or for somebody that's just kind, kind of trying to build a team around what they do. Um, so we have the info, I think, uh, as an industry. We just have to start applying it maybe just a little bit better. And I, I think just taking what we've been able to do over the last five years here at AMP, um, build a curriculum, learn from the best, build a curriculum, and also build a team around that vision so that, you know, me as an individual, you know, I, I started this on my own, but I had to go out there and get the best in the area and, and also build a team that, so that I'm not doing everything. Um, and I think that's, that's a big aspect that, you know, young, young and up and coming coaches deal with is that they want to be the answer to every one of their clients' problems. But sometimes you have to be a good, you have to refer people out. To, to a good physical therapist. You have to get in, in the area um, you know, of your business or even whether you're working out of a school or whatever it may be, utilize the, the professionals and the experts in your area to, to give your clients the experience that they deserve. Um, and that customer experience is what's gonna build results. Um, so if you invest in yourself first and foremost, invest in your team, and then be able to, again, build that team around you. I think that's the most important thing so that we can be that multifaceted approach, but it doesn't have to be an individual. I think that's, that's probably going to be the drive home aspect of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, and we, you know, we just talked to Mike Stella. Mike is, you know, he's your partner in the recovery lab, which is doing all of the mm -hmm. kind of physical therapy there. And Mike's an athletic trainer, obviously. And, and, you know, you guys are doing a lot of great stuff there with him. And I think, you know, look, I had my facility and I, I actually rented extra space to try to get a, a therapist in. But it's so hard to find that person that's really on the same page. But it's really worth it when I see what you guys are doing to, uh, you know, with making changes uh, with your clients. Like you talk about repeatable results. Um, it's really important to make sure you get that person. And look, it's great to refer out, but having that person in house, man, that's that's next level. Right. I would say that we really did build the dream scenario within AMP, um, you know, having the multifaceted approach of obviously the strength and conditioning, the performance training, but also the recovery, the manual therapy, the injury prevention uh, that Mike is, is heading up in the recovery lab. I mean, it's just been, you know, Mike's been with me from day one when, once we really, uh, you know, started to, to get serious about the business. And, you know, Mike, in day one, he was doing a little bit of everything, a little bit of coaching as well. Him and I actually went to school together, Marist College. He played lacrosse. I played football. We were both in the athletic training and sports medicine department. Um, and, you know, we kind of went our separate ways after college and then reconvened a couple of years later um, because we both had the same passion. We kind of approaching it from a slightly different angle, but we both come from that sports medicine background that we understand the importance of evaluation, the importance of recovery, nutrition. Um, you know, just the program design and corrective exercise aspects of it. So, you know, we spoke the same language, which made it a lot easier for us to build what we've built today. Um, and now we're, we're, you're, we're grateful to be able to build a team where, you know, we're, we're coming in on about seven or eight employees now. So it's, uh, you know, we're really starting to see what we're capable of uh, by building a team of like-minded individuals, but not just, you know, we're not, we're not in, in love with one specific way of doing things. We're open-minded. We have to change and reevaluate what we do uh, on an everyday basis. And that kind of, that's kind of what keeps us on our toes as well. Uh, TJ, does that present a problem once in a while, just in terms of like, for example, like, you know, an assessment, right? I mean, we all have different ways of doing our assessment. Even people who will say, I do the FMS, they might just do like three things in the FMS, right? So, you know, you got a guy, right. like, you know, a therapist like Mike comes in, they have Usually, or an athletic trainer, they have a, a little bit more of a, uh, you know, an exhaustive assessment process. Has that been a challenge kind of, you know, having this uh, collaboration and making sure you're on the same page with something that in the two areas can be so different? Right, exactly. I mean, I think, you know, the way that we approach our every athlete is we do do an FMS with every one of our athletes. So Mike and I are both uh, very proficient in the FMS. So we, we speak the same language there and our entire staff, we've actually brought Frank Dolan, who will be speaking um, at our event. We brought Frank Dolan in for the day to kind of, again, just kind of get it from another angle because Frank's, uh, you know, a, prof a professor or a, 
a presenter with FMS. Yeah. And just to get another angle and kind of, you know, make sure that we're, we're doing everything the right way um, in, in a standard way. And it's, a, you know, standard operating procedure is something that needs to be applied in any business that, that, that you want to be replicable, uh, repeatable. So, you know, when it comes to either repeating results or one day down the line, repeating this, this business and maybe multiplying it in, in one way or another. Uh, if you don't have a standard operating approach, then everybody's just winging it. And I think that that's, you know, that is somewhat of an issue in the industry as a whole. Um, it, it definitely comes with its challenges where people have their certain ways and, you know, we, but we're always open for, for conversation and for sometimes arguments over how things should be done. And that's really when you get to the bottom of it. And, you know, you kind of, you know, as a leader here, I have to, you know, be able to figure out, okay, you know, when, when to pick the battles. Um, but again, th those challenges are the things that will get us to the ultimate, the, the correct answer. Um, you know, and there's not just one right answer. There, there's multiple ways to, to get to it. But, um, you know, we, we just continue to challenge ourselves in that, you know, we have to stay principled in our approach, but we can't stay rigid at the same time. We can't just say, nope, this is how I do it. Um, you know, and, and that's what, what the industry has kind of showed us throughout the years is that you're allowed to change your mind. You know, Mike Boyle talks about it all the time. You're allowed to change your mind, um, but the principles rarely, uh, rarely change all that much. And the FMS is really a good, a good uh, guiding um, underlay to what we do in, in that, in that principle approach. Yeah. And, and I will say somebody listening might be like, oh, wow, well, you have a perfect situation, but you don't because you do also train. You've been training CC Sabathia from the Yankees since 2010 and you have some other NBA right. players. So you're always dealing with these other voices in their head and their team when they're away. Um, that's got to be tough to kind of how do you manage that piece of it? Because a lot of us out there are kind of in a CC Sabathia kind of a situation where, you know, my client is going to a different physical therapist in New York City and they're getting stuff from that. And they're like coming back saying, well, I'm supposed to do these, you know, this exercise right here. And you're like, oh, boy. Um, so how do you manage that piece of it? I think it's all through communication skills. Um, and that's not being a coach. That's just being a human. Right. You have to know how to communicate. You have to be, uh, you know, you have to be open minded. But you, there are things that you can disagree on, uh, absolutely. But you have to at least know what your clients are doing outside of your care, so that you're not overdoing something, or you're not you're not you know over fatiguing them, or or doing the same exact thing that they might be doing earlier in the in the morning, and then they come and see you, then you're 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 really not um, you know you're either overdoing or underdoing something. So understanding that whether it might not be under your four walls there still needs to be some semblance of a system so that you at least know what they're doing outside of your four walls. And that's, it, again, it just comes down to being a respectful communicator. Um, and, you know, not everybody else is open to that type of relationship, but I've been, you know, pretty blessed in, in dealing with uh, the Yankees and, the, and now with, with the Clippers. Um, I mean, the, the guys are just, they're just awesome. Very, very open-minded, very open to communication. Um, and at least, you know, again, we're, we're all there for the same goal. And that's for our clients to succeed, for our athletes to succeed. And, you know, if, if you have an ego, that, that sometimes may get in the way. But, you know, fortunately, I've been able to kind of work around those things uh, throughout my career. Yeah, it's so important to develop those relationships. Like even with something like this, like we have Thorn Research. They're going to be sponsoring. They got somebody come in. They're going to be, you know, displaying some products. We have uh, Norma Tech it will be in the house. We're working on getting a couple extra of the, uh, the booties so people can uh, – can try those on at different times during the day. Uh, we have, you know, Mike. Mike has a great relationship with Rock Tape, and he does a lot of uh, education for them. So uh, we got some stuff coming from them. Marigold Bars, uh, who you know is my sponsor on this show, as well as Strength Coach TV. Perform Better, who's been with me for eleven years on this show. That's the important piece. It's all these relationships because you know it's not only allows you to do it allows you to do some of these these things as well, not just kind of what's going on with training, but allows you to kind of continue your education, kind of keep uh, that fire burning when you develop these great relationships. Right. And, and it's, you know, everybody's gotten to the point in their career for, for a reason. And you may disagree with 99% of the way that they approach it or the way that they do certain things, but that 1%, you might be able to take away the way that they communicate something or, um, you know, the, the, the resources that they use. 
uh, the equipment that they may use. You can always pull at least 1% from somebody that you disagree with and make that a learning experience and take that moving forward. Um, and again, that's something that I've been able to do. And I've been around some of the greatest minds in, in uh, strength and conditioning, recovery, nutrition. And, you know, you just take a little bit from everybody and it really starts to build your, your view and your system as a coach yourself. Yeah, absolutely. All right, TJ, we're looking really forward to uh, the athlete breakthrough, building a system that produces repeatable results through a principled approach to evaluating coaching and motivating your clients. Could be the second longest title in uh, seminar history. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get it all in there. <laughs> TJ, thanks for doing this and uh, looking forward to seeing you on September 15th. Thanks so much, Anthony. Energy storing could probably be controversial because no matter how much you say you won't, you're trying to take this to sports specific. But the first energy storing we do is actually in that uh, counter load when the upper body helps the lower body jump in a standing long jump. But our real energy storing comes into play in running. Remember how I said we're going to grab our primal capacities from a child just like we did our fundamental movement patterns and functional movement patterns. Well, the last one is running. And running is basically energy storing, transferring energy from one leg to the other, storing that energy in the body and using your reciprocal arm action and basically your, your posterior anterior chain working together to just sort of bounce elegantly one side to the other. If I can hear you running, you're losing a lot of energy. And if I can't hear you running, you're conserving a lot of energy, regardless of how fast you're going. Speed comes later. But remember what we try to say in functional movement systems well before often. The biggest problem in modern fitness is, is, is we're doing it often before well. And, and it's simply because we don't have a baseline for what's good enough. Well, we've got a few different ways to do energy storing, but what we really want to see is we want to compress that one leg over a few energy storing cycles because it's really hard to see a problem in your running gait. And I can prove it. There are multiple running gait labs all around the country. And a lot of these people, after they've been overanalyzed on a treadmill and dissected as a runner, get sent to my clinic or some of my colleagues' clinics, and we find, oh, they're big toes stiff. They got no ankle mobility on that side. Would you believe there's a 50% difference in their left-right side plank? Running enthusiasts try to fix running at running. The only way you should ever work on the tactical and technical aspects of running is if you've demonstrated the fundamental base that other good runners possess. And how do we find that out? Well, it's really easy. Let's say you've got a team you're working with. If you've got their sports-specific data or performance data, and you've got a movement screen and you've got a fundamental capacity screen, then you can go back into the group and without knowing any of the test scores, you can go ahead and say, what's my best group of competitors who's always here, who's always healthy, blah, blah, blah. Basically, you can find the 10% of the group that you wish you could clone. <laughs> look at their movement screens, look at their other tests, and look at their fundamental capacity screen. And then make one statement across the board for this specific environment, this specific team, this specific Petri dish. This is how bad your movement screen can be and still be one of those guys. This is how bad your carry can be and still be one of those guys. This is how bad your balance can be and still be one of those guys. This is how bad your power and energy storing can be and still be one of those guys or girls. You see what I'm saying? Most people want us to give them the specific information in their environment. I will simply hand you a yardstick and go start measuring stuff in your environment. Because everything's going to measure differently, but in your group, you've got the favorable, durable performers, and you've got the delicate headaches all over the place. The low-level performers, they don't learn quickly, or they're not available due to injury or whatever problem is. And so what you can do is demonstrate in your own environment, there's a physical barrier to skill acquisition. So if I've got a group in the team that I want more of, and I already know all of their movement screen and fundamental capacity screen statistics, as well as their sports statistics and injury history, then I've got a group and I've got them profiled. And if you've covered all their physical metrics, then the reason you're not a durable performer isn't physical from weight room standards, from strength conditioning standards. It is a tactical, technical, or grit problem. Got it? Now, the one thing we can do in strength conditioning is foster grit, showing you how to stick to it. Carries are a great way to do that. Some, some interval training is a great way to do that. But if I've got a physical metric that you need to cover, I can stand 
firmly on that data and say, this seems to be a physical barrier to acquisition because nobody in the group you want to be in is this poor on this test. No debate, no discussion. If you cover the metric and you're still not a durable performer, then I need you to take that extra physicality and apply it to tactical or technical situations that are more specific. In the next section, I'm going to finish up talking about energy storing and then show you how we apply this information to grow communication and accountability in a rehabilitation and strength conditioning environment. All right, that's going to do it for episode 237 of the Strength Coach Podcast special. Thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better. Right now, Perform Better, huge summer sale, going on for a little, another month probably. But uh, you got to get in on this 40% off so many items, sleds, dumbbells, kettlebells, foam rollers, all their best stuff. You can check it out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. All right, thanks to TJ Lopez, Pat Davidson, Mike Stella for sharing their topics for the upcoming AMP Fall Seminar, September 15th, just outside of Manhattan in Long Island. Uh, remember, if you want the special price, email me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com with the heading AMP Seminar. And I'll send you a link that'll give you a super early bird price of $250. That's a special price. Uh, so I don't want to publish the link. But if you email me, I'll send it to you. That's an incredible deal for this seminar. All right, thanks to Adam Doughty, Tim Robinson, and Train Heroic. Head over to trainheroic.com. Start your 14-day free trial. Let them know Anthony sent you. They'll save 10% off your first year of Train Heroic Pro Edition. If you're not doing online training, guys, you're missing out on the boat. And to me, this is the best platform. Rachel Cosgrove and the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Great Cook and Functional Movement System. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. Thanks to Marigold Bars, my new Hit the Gym of the Train Coach segment sponsor. High quality protein with all the premium ingredients, grass-fed protein, gluten-free, organic ingredients, non-GMO, no preservatives, low sugar, and they taste amazing. Guys, go to marigoldbars.com. You can use the code SHRINKCOACH10. You'll get $10 off your first order. All right, my name is Anthony Randy. You can go to continuefit.com for all my stuff, including that all the info on the AMP seminar. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.